Uh, I picked a subject you uh, normally don't hear too much about at church. Uh, uh, the other one is hell. <laughs> it's not one of the favorite topics. But this one has to do with wealth or money and uh, why. Uh, yeah, I watched the news this evening, and uh, they had the national debt clock on. And as I was watching it, it rolled over $15 trillion. It, we finally made it. Yay! <laughs> so uh, I think the commentator said that only amounts to about 141000 for each living person in the United States, a population of about $311 million. I said, oh, good. We'll just all work about uh, five years and give it all to the government, and we'll be debt-free in this nation. <laughs> but uh, then a, a couple of years ago, I realized something, well, I realized it earlier, that something wasn't going quite right with uh, the economy. And uh, so I, I uh, uh, wanted to find out what, What's the Bible say about the economy and money and wealth and management thereof? Or another way to put it, the way Christians like to use stewardship. Ooh, <laughs> big word. Uh, but I, uh, I was listening at that time to a, to a, a preacher named uh, Dr. David Jeremiah out of San Diego. And uh, he, he had written a book, this is last year, I think uh, 2010, about the coming, coming economic Armageddon. And this book uh, is an eye-opener. Uh, he, he puts this in the, in the uh, area of the final days, what we'll see. And we see in so many aspects of the final days that this part of it is just part of it. We, we see the... the Children of Israel uh, going back to Israel. Uh, we see earthquakes. We see, quote, if it is global warming, but definitely some strange things in the weather going on. Earthquake in places they've never had earthquakes. And then there are these financial earthquakes. And I'm not just talking about the United States. I'm from Europe. And I was over there about six weeks in May and June. And same stuff is going on over there. Germany is a little better off than the others, but it, it can uh, by itself handle the whole mess over there. So people are rioting in the streets uh, in Europe, more so than over here. A little bit of that going on here too now. And uh, basically it's uh, a mass confusion. They don't know what, what's going on in this world. This world is... is turn on its head, you know, it's, it, this is not the way it was supposed to happen. Well, Dr. Jeremiah does a real good job explaining that in 10 chapters, and nine chapters will have to do with explaining to us what's going on in the end times with the coming economic Armageddon. Oh, and, and when you get all through with that, you go down like this, woe is me, Lord. <laughs> but, uh, Read the 10th chapter. That's the one that uh, li will lift your spirits. Because he really, uh, and that's where most of my notes come out of tonight. The 10th chapter of this book, but also from our Bible, an old book, about, uh, what, uh, three, 4,000 years old, uh, give or take a few <laughs> millennia. And... Uh, I, I like to call it, when in, on this world, my tech manual. I'm an ex-engineer, so this is my tech manual. So all the answers are really in here, or in God's Word. And so I want to talk about wealth, and, and as far as a biblical approach to wealth. Well, what is wealth? I, I said, well, wealth is money. Wealth is uh, possessions. Um, houses, farms, animals, and uh, where did it come from? Lord, the, the Lord. All, it all belongs to the, 
And the Bible says, the cattle on a thousand hills belong to the Lord. So all wealth and money come from God. They're given to us. And he wants to see what we do with it. So he, he wants to see how well we manage his wealth. Because he's going to come back one day, and he's, he's going to ask each one of us, uh, what you do with my wealth that I let you have for a while to manage? And we're going to have to give an account. Uh, so in the Bible, oh, I need my other notes, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm com- going to come out of chapter 10 here. And uh, the Bible has a lot to say about wealth and money. Besides love, wealth is the second uh, most uh, highest uh, topic in the Bible. Uh, I have a uh, in here. I don't know. Yeah, here. Here we go. I'm just a little bit. You know, I, I, I was saying myself. I don't. I hope I, I'm not like Moses where I need Aaron to speak. Or in more modern terms, I hope I don't have one of those uh, Governor Perry moments. <laughs> But I have a very forgiving crowd here, and so I'm in the right place. Uh, In the Bible, there are about 2,350 verses about finances and money. And in the New Testament alone, there are 126 financial instructions given to us about uh, money and wealth and our relationship to it. So... It's a, it's a, a formidable uh, topic, and uh, since I spend a lot of my, my life chasing wealth, <laughs> and we all do, uh, we ought to, I, I figured I might could learn something of what I'm supposed to do with it all, <laughs> and how I'm supposed to manage it, or the stewardship thereof. It's just like me, another Perry moment. I had some really good notes, but anyhow, um, I'll just come straight out of the book. I can do it that way, too. (laughs) Chapter 10. So I have it highlighted in there. And I'm, I'm coming, yeah. The biblical approach to money. What does God really expect from us uh, and our wealth? Uh, the Bible doesn't see money and riches exactly like we do. In fact, this is Dr. uh, David Jeremiah uh, writing. Scripture shows that God's perspective on wealth is the opposite from that of most of us. He's not overly concerned about our building massive wealth here on earth, but he's highly concerned that we build a solid foundation for spiritual future. In other words, he... He wants to examine, uh, it's, it's like a test that's given to us. He wants to see how we manage that which he allows us to, uh, to have. In the mini- at, uh, this part of it that God is not overly concerned about money, we, we, we've heard that. But in many places the Bible warns that money is as transient as a butterfly. Proverbs 27, 24 says that riches are not forever. Through his prophet Haggai, the Lord told the backslidden Israelites that they were, they were earning wages only to put the money into a bag with holes. See Haggai 1, 6. In the New Testament, Paul warns us not to trust in wealth, which is uncertain. And Jesus said, and this most of you all know, do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, in Matthew 6, 19. He wasn't forbidding us to be prudent savers or plan for the future. He was simply saying our permanent wealth is eternal, but the dollar, the pound, and the euro are not. And that's 
for sure, as we could see uh, on the foreign exchange market with these currencies. Uh, it's almost like, Lord, should I start studying Mandarin Chinese now? Because <laughs> they own that 15 trillion that I mentioned, they own a good bit of that. And we're going to look into and see what that, what does that mean? They own a good chunk of it. And I don't know exactly, but I, I think it's around three trillion that they own so far. And the number is growing. So uh, I want to go to a very wise resource in the Bible. It was King, King Solomon. He's the wisest man that ever lived and one of the richest men that ever lived. He may have been the richest at that time in the world, definitely. Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, seems to agree with this. In his memoirs, the often neglected book of Ecclesiastes, uh, King Solomon had much to say about money, even devoting an entire chapter to, this, to the dispensing of his monetary wisdom. He began by saying five things about money and greed. And these all come out of Ecclesiastes 5. And I want, the more we have, the more we want. That's his first <laughs> comment. Now, by this time, he's writing his memoirs. He's pretty old now. And uh, he reigned for 40 years, just like his father, David, in Jerusalem. And uh, so he, he had, and he was very wise and he had seen a lot, so the more money we have, the more we want. The more we have, the more we spend. The more we have, the more we worry. Uh, that's, uh, yeah, that's a lot of worried people running around this world right now. The more we have, the more we lose. Does that mean we all have to give it all away so we don't have anything to worry about? The more we have, the more we leave behind. Not necessarily, but uh, that, that's, uh, that, those are the five uh, wisdoms about dispensing money. Solomon went on to say two things about money and God. First, the power to earn money comes from God. The, the power God gives us the power and the strength to go earn money. So Solomon says, here's what I have seen. It is good and fitting for one to eat and drink and to enjoy the good of all his labor in which he toils under the sun all the days of his life which God gives him, for it is his heritage. So God's, uh, uh, this comes from God. God uh, wants us to enjoy the fruit of our labors as long as we've earned it honestly. Second, the, the power to, which is part of this too, the, the power to earn the money is given to you from God to begin with. Uh, but the power to enjoy your money is also comes from God. As, as Solomon goes on and says, as for every man to whom God has given riches and wealth and given him power to eat of it, to receive his heritage and rejoice in his labor, this is a gift of God. So God will, uh, is even giving us the, the gift to, to enjoy our heritage that we have labored and toiled for. What, what does it say? Actually, to work is a tremendous blessing. Uh, and there's a lot of people in our country that don't have the blessing right now. And you can see what it does to people when they, they are not blessed by to have a job so that they can, can earn and, and enjoy the fruits of their labor. And then he goes on to say, this is a gift of God, for he will not dwell unduly on the days of his life because God keeps him busy with the joy of his, hearts, his heart. So, even the, the power to earn the money does not come from us. Definitely doesn't come from Satan. It comes from God. And every day when, when you go to work or you labor in whatever fashion you do and, and uh, 
you, you are a, that, that's given from God and is a bless, as a blessing. The, and the power to even enjoy it uh, is, is, a, is even given by God. Now, uh, let's see. I'm great with notes. So, we get down to keeping our own house in order. And so now I want to turn more from up to now. I've been talking primarily about uh, the country and the needs we have, the world and what's going on, and uh, uh, even the state here and what's going on in the city. But now I want to talk about how, what can the individual do? You know, what, I'm not going to be able to uh, correct of what's, what the debt in the United States. I can't really move those things, the, the, the buttons and the levers that gets the world economic order back into gear. The only thing I have is myself, really, and, and that's a job to get that under control, especially for me. So I, I thought uh, that the serenity prayer is a good one to pray when if you're running around and you're really worried about the future and everything looks so bleak, uh, you know, God give me the serenity to accept those things that I can't change, the world order. And give me, however, give me the courage to change those things that I can change and the wisdom to know the difference. That's back there on the, on, the, on the picture frame above that table back then. That's a very wise statement. And so the only, each one of us has to work on, on that part of themselves that, that manages God's wealth, the stewardship of it. And Dr. Jeremiah says the first thing every person needs to do is to take a personal inventory. Well, what does that mean? Well, in, in the first analysis is you got to be you, you got to find the truth. You discover the truth, face the real truth, write down the pluses and the minuses, and uh, when it looks uh, and accept it, you'll never change anything unless that unless you face it. And so many people say, eh, I don't want to worry about that. that. That's for somebody else to do. Uh, you know, so uh, you'll never change what you do not acknowledge. So take some time in your life and just ref you know, maybe tax time is a good time or whatever time and, and look over, list all the pluses and minuses, take inventory. Uh, the second thing he recommends is to minimize indebtedness. And there, uh, there's a, a note here that says, it, the total U.S. consumer debt, which includes credit cards and non-credit card debt, but not mortgages, reached $2.45 trillion as of March 2010. That's about, about when this book came out. So $2.45 trillion, or might as well round it up about, that's how much of the, the national debt about what, 20% uh, uh, is in credit cards and so on. So, so he says, most people don't, this, this debt not, does not include the mortgage. It, it's just uh, at a very high interest rate, of course. So you need to, med med the Bible doesn't forbid indebtedness, but it warns about its misuse. For instance, Proverbs points out that the borrower is in danger of becoming a servant or slave to the lender. And that's where my statement came from. Maybe we need to start learning Mandarin Chinese on the side. Because they, they are uh, buying our debt in big numbers. And uh, from what's going up by our, in Washington, it's, it's, it's not looking better. Uh, Six time, and additionally, six times, Proverbs warns against co-signing another's notes. It says, don't, six times it has 
comments in Proverbs, uh, mostly s chapter 6, about against co-signing another's notes. Pastor Bob has a part of the sermon where <laughs> he says <laughs> his experience with co-sign. I, I have never co-signed anybody's notes, but uh, his, his message about co-sign <laughs> Because you better get ready to pay for it yourself if you're going to co-sign. Okay, one of, <laughs> especially when your sons, and I have two of them, come and say, Dad, I just got another good car, and uh, what are my financing options? <laughs> financing options? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so don't co-sign. <laughs> Uh, in this book, it, it points out that there are very, a lot of very good Christian financial ministries. And you might have heard it on WKCL, but he says that uh, Crown Financial uh, Ministries is, is a good one. There are others. And uh, they have an 11-week study course you could do. And people that have taken this Averaged a reduction of personal debt of 38%, increased their saving by 27%, and increased their giving by 72%. So, taking a, a study course through one of the Christian ministries would be a good idea. Uh, he recommends going on the Crown Financial website. You get all the information. And uh, they are definitely... Uh, Bible-based uh, budgeting, managing stewardship. Okay. I, what I wanted to speak about next is the uh, managing of money themselves. And th now we get to the small part on the back of the, the sheet, and I, I apologize for the size of it, but it <laughs> it is small, but it's about the size of what you see in a small newspaper. <laughs> uh, Dr. Jeremiah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you see, he was even quite handy. He gave us a, a uh, I have a study book, and where's that little, that little handout he gave, foldout he gave us? I'm losing everything tonight. I'm awful. But anyhow, all these principles, he came up with, uh, and certainly those are not all, he came up with uh, seven principles, not the up, up, nine principles of uh, how to manage your money. And the first, uh, he says, follow the advice given in this sampling of, sampling of wise and practical principles from the Bible, and your finances will stay afloat in the worst economic storms. The desire principle. Uh, it's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure resides is the place you will most wa want to be and end up being and, and uh, you know, want to be and then you end up being there and you can't worship two gods at once. Loving one god, you'll end up hating the other. Adoration of one feeds contempt for the other. You can't worship God and money both. So what, what is this saying? That, that money, is, is that saying that money can become your God or wealth? doesn't have to be money. It be, uh, in, it, I looked up the, the word money, and the first coin money was done about 800 B.C. By in, in the Middle East by a... Uh, tribe there and, and nation, the Lydians, they were the first in history that, that they said started making these little silver and gold coins. And then, of course, the Greeks picked it up from them, and then, of course, later the Romans and the Egyptians too. So money's been around uh, for about 2,800 years. So it's an old concept, but really, at least the money had the money itself has a, before that people used uh, cattle as money 
Actually, cattle was a, like, that was the $100 bill or the $1,000 bill. And then they, they used, the, the way of trading was barter. Now, that was honest, because when you, you know, bought a wife and you knew there were 10 cows, and that, that, would, that was a, you know, good swap there. You know? <laughs> I heard the Indians use horses, but what, what, <laughs> what? So, so the bartering system has been around since mankind started. Uh, and, uh, but then, then some bright fellas uh, came up and uh, he uh, invented something new. And I didn't find out when they did. And I have this here, five dollar bill. Now this thing, what is this? Is this? A, it's a little piece of paper. Can't eat it. You, you know, you can't really, there's no silver in there or gold, so you can make a ring or a piece of jewelry out of it. And uh, so it's uh, a rather worthless object. <laughs> and it's becoming more worthless every day. <laughs> But one thing about our money is different than the German money and the, the British pounds and all that monies I've seen in Europe and some overseas as I traveled for the Navy. It has a very important statement on here. In gold we trust. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> this, this is confusing. It doesn't say in gold we trust. It says in God we trust. Now... I, th I thought that was separation of church and state in this country. <laughs> but we still have that on here, and it's on all the little coins. And actually, the most worth, the, the, the piece of money that's worth the most today is a, is a copper penny. There's almost a penny's worth of copper in a penny. The rest of it is all fake. <laughs> so... Uh, I thought that was, yeah, i throw that in for free. That was, in, in, uh, was interesting. But, but then the bottom line is, can money or wealth become your God? Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. It's, it's rampant in this world and in our country. The more we separate church and state in the sense that the more we take God's basic laws out of society, the more, guess what? The more uh, wealth and money becomes our God. There is, and, and many other, in many other areas too, what happened to honesty or a good day's labor and all that, when you start taking these things out of schools and out of libraries and forbidding them to be spoken in the marketplace, then what comes is chaos or uh, the Antichrist. <laughs> and uh, we've had a, a thorough Europe. I, uh, one thing I, I brought out to the, the men in Sunday school was when I came to America at age about 15, and I was raised in the Lutheran church uh, by some godly grandparents, and uh, I went to North Louisiana to a little town called Ferry Day across the river from Mississippi River, from Natchez, Mississippi. And on Sunday morning, it was just astonishing to me that at 1955, that 80% of, I would say, of, of the people in that, about 3,600 people, of those people were in churches. There were cars just knee deep around all the churches. And on Main Street, all you could see is a dog walk across the road. When the car, car's moving. And I said, how marvelous is this? In, in Germany, you get, if you're lucky, you get 15%. And uh, that was only Easter and Christmas. <laughs> so it's, uh, <laughs> they have the most beautiful cathedrals that people of faith built 800 years ago. And they're all museums. The people, they charge money. To, well, they don't charge money, but they, are, they ask you for a donation to go through so they can keep it relatively clean, you know, or keep the roof repaired. But uh, in America, it was special when I came. As I said, 80% of the, the people were in churches. But as I've gone back to my little town, uh, when on my trips to Louisiana, where my sister still lives, that slowly has changed now in 2010. And uh, 
Well, when, we, when I lived there, there were no grocery stores open. There were no, maybe one gas station open. And I don't know about a restaurant that was open until maybe 1 o'clock, some open so the people from church could stop and get something to eat. But the, the town was, it's like, like tumbleweeds rolling down the street. Well, now, I think the bars are all open 24-7, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, it's just changed tremendously, and I've been here uh, pretty close to 60 years now. So, and it's, it's not a change for the good. And, uh, it, uh, our nation uh, needs to repent and get back to God, like our money says. And don't trust in gold, trust in God, and God will be gracious and forgive us. And... Uh, Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. <laughs> All right, now let's go on to. Uh, I'm not going to keep keep us too long here. Let's go on to the second step there on my bullet list, and if I can find it. There it is. The discernment principle. All, besides ha having to have the right desire principle, we got to have the, a good discernment principle. Remove falsehood and lies far from me. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with the food allotted to me, lest I be full and deny you and say, Who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal and profane the name of God. Proverbs 38-9. So, uh, God provides riches, and God sometimes provides, uh, puts us to some tests to see how we'll do when the riches are not there. Okay, so uh, this uh, writer here in Proverbs says, uh, the, the main thing is remove that, uh, prove, basically prove to me that, that your God, not, not gold and money. Next he goes on, discussion principle. Listen to counsel and receive instructions. Proverbs 19.20. In the multitude of counselors, there is safety. Now what is he saying here is, don't act on the spurt. Run it, let it run through your head, sleep on it. And uh, go find some people that might know about this issue. Do some homework. Because if you'll do enough homework, the odds, especially Christian homework, <laughs> the odds are you, you will uh, not make a foolish uh, investment of your, of your uh, uh, resources. The disciple principle is number four. A faithful man will abound with blessings, but he who hastens to be rich will not go unpunished. A man with an evil eye hastens after riches and does not consider the poverty, that poverty will come up on him. Well, you know, that seems to like we just recently saw some billionaires head for jail. Uh, many, so hasten for riches, what does that imply? I'm ready to cut some corners. To, to speed this process, this process that God's got in motion for me is going too slow. I got to cut some corners to get to the goal that I've set myself uh, a little faster. And the writers of Proverbs warns against that. Be content in the place that you are at. And contentment is the key to that, that that you realize where I'm at is where God put me in this moment, and I might be in jail, I might be very bad off, but God let that happen to me for a reason. And so we, we are to con con be content in our situation and praise the Lord anyhow. And uh, I've been there. Uh, when I come to this country, some... 1955, I had a hundred, a hundred mark, and, no, it was 400 marks, which was about $100 in a paperback suitcase. And on the way over, 
I uh, was in a refugee camp in Czechoslovakia for uh, right at the end of the war. And uh, we almost, my mother and my grandma and I almost starved to death in there. In the, after the war years, the late 40s in Germany, there was not much food. So we basically slaved ourselves out to local farmers and, and we went after the, after the potato crops and, and, and we got a few more potatoes out of the ground. And then my grandmother could sue and she made us, uh, she raised rabbits and she made us clothes out of rabbits and army blankets, which she dyed blue. But anyhow, so, uh, but I was a happy little fella. And, and I didn't think, I thought that was normal. And, you know, I thought the whole world was that way. So uh, be content in the position that God's put you, uh, uh, put you in. Don't hasten for riches. If, if you uh, show the Lord that, you, uh, that you're going to uh, manage or uh, steward, be the right steward over the, the little that he's given you, who knows, he might give you more to manage. Okay, the depreciation principle. And Matthew says this, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where th thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. And uh, I think we... We are encouraged here to, the, the certain amount of wealth we have, we are to listen to God. To when On my way here to church, there's a gas station on the corner. And out there is always one or two homeless people. And it took me a while, I said, why are they always on this corner up there where I live? Well, the railroad track runs down. They sleep in the ditches behind. I, I, I seen one or two come out of there, and they jump off the railroad car, because the long train stopped there once in a while, and they sleep in the bushes, and then they come out, and they go to the, the corner uh, grocery gas station, and they sit there, and one of, one of them was always cleaning up around there for some coffee, and the end... I was see, seen him sit there, and I, I said to myself, there but for the grace of God go I, you know, because they, they look cold and hungry. So, you know, uh, that, that one's easy. Y you know, you pass them a five or a few dollars, whatever you have, and say, go get you some breakfast somewhere. But, uh, and if you need a church, I know a good one you can come to. So uh, we, we are to use... We have to accumulate our wealth with in mind of what we can share at times with others. And God will show us. We don't have to go around and, and strive at this. God will, if we listen, God will show us how to disperse a little bit of our wealth. Okay. Because the uh, depreciation principle says, you know, like, you might have $100 today. The odds are five or 10 years from now, it's worth 50 or maybe even less the way things are going. So you might as well bless somebody a little bit. Okay, the due diligence principle six. For which of you in intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost, whether he has enough to finish it, lest after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, Luke 14, 28, and 29. In other words, it says, sit down, uh, draw up some plans, calculate the, uh, the cost of this thing, and store up the materials, you know. Uh, David was only allowed to set aside the materials for the temple, which by the time his son Solomon started on temple. All Solomon then had to do is find the laborers to build it. David had provided all the, 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 uh, the main materials they needed, the stones and some of the, lump, the, the lumber came from Lebanon and 
and the gold and the silver for everything. So you, before you start on something, count the cost. Well, what do we do over in this country? We give everybody a house. <laughs> and <laughs> whether they can afford it or not, that's wonderful until the bills come due. You know, and then we want to be bailed out by, the, by, by you and me, <laughs> by the taxpayer or by the government. Because, as I said, we're all going to have to work for a few years to pay off our national debt. And uh, we should, and not ask our children and grandchildren to. I have children and grandchildren. I don't want them to pay on my debt. Uh, it just doesn't sit right with me. The diversification principle, that was interesting. Give a serving to seven and also to eight, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Ecclesiastes 11, 2. And what that means, if you want to invest the sum of money to produce a crop, uh, spread it around. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. You know, that's the diversification principle. And here's something that, that's kind of gone by the wayside uh, in America, uh, the descendant principle. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children, but the wealth of a sinner is stored up for the righteous. In other, other words, says uh, a good man provides not only for his children, but for his grandchildren. But if, if one that doesn't manage is right, what little they have, I guess the tax man gets anyhow. They don't get <laughs> anything. So uh, another, po another uh, verse here. But if anyone does not provide for his own, especially for those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now what, uh, that's in, out of uh, Timothy 5.8. Well, what about all these fatherless children we have in this nation? And the fathers, uh, you know, he says they're worse than an unbeliever. And uh, it's, it's, it's a shame. And the other one, uh, the last one here is very interesting, too, because you can draw a lot of inferences out of this. In 2 Corinthians 12, 14, for the children ought, ought not to, to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. We got that backwards, don't we? When we think about the social security system, it's called a generational trust. Is a generational trust biblical? Not according to this verse. That it, it basically, the children are being asked to pay for the parents. But this says the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. In other words, Social Security should be set up so that it provides for the generation it's laid up for and not waste it so that the next generation has to pay for the previous generation. Because who knows if there's going to be a next generation. <laughs> so... Uh, we we kind of have that. Now, I'm not saying that Social Security is a bad thing, but it's set up wrong. It should be that each generation should pay for their own expenses, as God allows. Okay, and the last principle he, he talks about here is, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will overflow with new wine. In other words, since God, as I mentioned earlier, owns all the cattle, it's all his. Every, every dollar that he, or every asset that he lets you acquire in your life belong to him, anyhow. So uh, in order to acknowledge that, God asks it, us to provide the first fruit to him. Now, this is almost uh, against some people's religion. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> you know, this is also one of the topics besides hell that, that, 
that you don't hear that much in church. <laughs> but uh, secondly, so let each one of you give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Uh, I don't give grudgingly, but I'm not necessarily at all times just cheerful. And I have to <laughs> remind myself, <laughs> be a cheerful giver and don't cheat God, because just cheating yourself is what that amounts to. Uh, in, in toward conclusion here, I wanted to mention some things that I uh, thought about. How can I wrap this up? And this book had a good thing. It said that was a bumper sticker, bumper sticker that carried a profound message. It says, "No," in other words, knowing, "No God, no hope." No, and oh God, no hope. <laughs> that was a bumper sticker. And uh, to wrap up uh, the Christian budgeting for me, it, if, you, if you remember nothing else out of this except my 80-20 uh, plan, <laughs> you have everything you need. Uh, you don't need 999, you just need my 80-20 plan. And here's my 80-20. My grandparents taught me that in Germany. Here's the 80-20 plan. Give 10% to God, save 10%, and learn to live off the other 80%. If you practice that for your life, you, it's not guaranteed, but you most likely will not want. And you definitely won't probably be a slave to anyone else. And you don't have to learn Chinese either. So... <laughs> Uh, what kind of faith we need. And here's a, a very difficult story, and I wanted to read this. It's just a short story. Uh, it's about World War II, which I was born in. I remember some of the end of that airplanes getting knocked out of the sky and coming down burning in the barns. But anyhow, during the difficult days of World War II, a young Jewish girl in the Warsaw ghetto of Poland managed to escape over the wall and hide in a cave. Tragically, she died in that cave shortly before the Allied army broke into the ghetto, ghetto and liberated the prisoners. But before she died, she scratched on the wall some powerful words that sound like a creed. I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. She was in a cave. I believe in love, even when I cannot feel it. Wasn't much love around. And I believe in God even when he's silent. That's what she wrote in that cave. This young girl endured dark days and great trauma in her life, but she maintained a hope in the face of the apparent hopelessness. So don't despair about the coming economic Armageddon. Uh, yeah, regardless of what happens, we win. We read the end of the book, like I said, and uh, we, uh, we have hope in God, like our money says, and uh, Jesus died for our sins on the cross, and that's the greatest thing that ever happened to us. Well, that's all I got. I'm sorry it was...